In 2014, the largest outbreak of Ebola ever recorded occurred in West Africa. Around 11,000 people died of the virus before it was contained and mass hysteria took over the world, but the fear wasn't completely unfounded. Ebola is a very infectious disease, with a high chance of infection once in contact with bodily fluids, and then a 60-70% to 70 chance of death. The last outbreak was four years ago from this video's upload, and yet we still don't know for certain what caused it. This video aims to showcase and explain the leading hypothesis into what caused such devastation. The idea goes that Ebola is spread by bats, and that somehow humans catch it from them. For this to be true, four things need to be able to happen. Bats need to be able to catch the disease and survive, harbour the disease, be able to spread it to other bats, and more importantly humans, and it needs to be found in wild bats to confirm they actually have Ebola. This video was made in collaboration with thingswedontknow.com, a science education company that aims to explain the questions that we don't know the answers to yet, encouraging an awareness of current scientific research and helping to identify what areas new discoveries could be made in. With their help, this video will be looking at the mysteries of whether bats spread Ebola. Bats are communal animals, they love socialising and so live in colonies. Bat colonies can number anywhere from 20 individuals living in an attic and the lining of roofs to places such as Bracken Cave outside San Antonio, Texas that numbers 20 million, the largest colony in the world during the summer. With bats living with so many others in such close quarters with each other, it's easy for diseases to spread. Bats rarely carry diseases other than the most severe, such as rabies and Marburg, which is mainly down to their superb immune systems and strangely hot bodies. A bat's immune system has to be very effective because of the large amounts of energy they use up to fly. This produces free radicals. Free radicals are single atoms that need to have full outer shells, so they scavenge the body to find other molecules to take electrons from. This causes damage to the cells because once a free radical forms, it will take electrons from adjacent molecules, making them free radicals, that then take electrons from others, and so on and so on until the whole cell is damaged. It can then cause cancerous tumours and end up killing the whole organism, so it's essential to a bat's survival that it has an overreactive immune system that can repair cells. This also means it will be much better at fighting off diseases. Humans and other mammals have similar versions of the genes that make bats' immune systems so active, but the difference is that bats have much more of these genes turned on than other mammals do. Bats have very strange body temperature shifts. Unlike humans who through homeostasis keep our bodies at regular temperatures between 37 and 39 degrees, bats' bodies seem to get much hotter. When they fly, their body temperatures heat up to around 40 degrees. Human bodies experience temperatures like this when we have heat stroke or severe fever resulting in headache, dizziness and sometimes loss of consciousness, and yet bats experience it every day. Coming back to severe fevers, these temperatures kill off all but the most dangerous viruses, and this, coupled with those superb immune systems, is why bats only ever seem to have such severe diseases, because these are the only ones that can survive. So if Ebola could survive the inhospitable environment inside a bat, how would it get in in the first place? Being infected by other bats in the colony is a viable theory, but another is that insects also carry Ebola and pass it on to bats when bats consume them. Angolan free-tailed bats are found where the outbreak occurred, and they consume mainly insects, so this is very possible. If a bat is infected with the disease, it still has to survive inside the bat and replicate for it to be effective. To test whether this could happen, Professor Robert Swinepole from the University of Pretoria, South Africa, infected 24 different plants and 19 different animals with Ebola to see in which ones the virus survived and replicated. The virus died in most of the organisms tested, but it did survive and replicate for 12 days inside a fruit bat and the previously mentioned free-tailed bat, and it didn't kill the host, which is essential to the spread of the disease. Other bats tested were all immune to Ebola, which raises the question of whether bats are really to blame. Another study done by Professor Eric Leroy from the French Institute of Research and Development further supports the growing doubt that bats are the culprit. He tested 679 fruit bats for the presence of Ebola. Only 13 had any trace of Ebola, and only 16 with any antibodies to fight Ebola, 
which means only a few of these bats ever came into contact with the disease, and those that had successfully fought it off and never became hosts. Ebola is transmitted through contact with an infected individual's bodily fluids, so how would it get from bats to humans if they are to blame? Bats are eaten a lot as bushmeat in West African countries, which is most likely how it would spread to humans. Other zoonotic diseases are spread this way, such as HIV from eating primates that have SFE, a related virus that many primates carry. In the case of the 2014 outbreak, the disease is thought to have come from a two-year-old boy who somehow came into contact with bat meat from a hollow tree near his hometown of Milandu in Guinea. He could have eaten some of the bat meat and from there he spread it to his family who caught Ebola and sadly died. Because of this, bushmeat has been banned in many West African countries, including Guinea and Cameroon. This isn't just good for stopping the spread of zoonotic diseases, it's also good for the endangered pangolin. If you want to learn more about pangolins, here's the video we did on it. This ban, like all bans, still hasn't stopped everyone from eating bushmeat. Poverty means that people still have to eat bushmeat to survive, which only makes the spread of zoonotic diseases worse. If meat is cooked properly, it's much safer to eat, but the people at most risk of catching zoonotic diseases are those who hunt and prepare the meat as they come into contact with raw bodily fluids. Because of the possibility of bats spreading Ebola, many people want to cull bats, like the badger cull in Britain to prevent TB. This is a big problem, as there is no conclusive evidence it is bats that spread Ebola, but the bigger issue is that culling bats would cause more damage than good. Bats are a key player in their ecosystems, they are called indicator species. Because of their role in these ecosystems, you can study bat behaviour in populations to give you an overall view of how successful the ecosystem is and whether there's anything threatening it. Culling bats would also cause more deaths than it would save from potentially stopping Ebola, mainly because bats are thought to eat most of the insect pests, saving poor farmers in low-income developing countries thousands on pesticides. More importantly, because bats eat so many insects, it means they help prevent malaria, which is a much larger killer than Ebola ever was. Another way in which bats are vital to farmers is that they pollinate tropical crops that bees don't. Approximately 450 different crops are pollinated by bats, such as bananas, agave, and cocoa. Culling bats would not only potentially not stop Ebola due to the possibility they don't spread it, it would also cause the collapse of ecosystems, economies, and leave many to die. In the end, we don't know if bats do or do not spread Ebola. There is plenty of evidence, such as where the 2014 outbreak stemmed from, to support bats carrying Ebola, but the lack of Ebola antibodies in bats studied supports them not being the problem. It will take much more time and effort to find out for certain. When Ebola outbreaks occur, the main focus is on saving people's lives, not finding out what started it. The only way we could ever know for certain is to test every bat until we found one living with Ebola, but there are hundreds of millions of bats, most of which live in remote areas and underground, so we could never test them all. As we mentioned at the beginning, this video was made with help from Things We Don't Know, a science education company based here in the UK. It is the goal of this organisation to create a place where all the questions that science is still finding answers to can be collected in order to help increase public awareness of them and to aid researchers in finding the topics that are currently being investigated. This place is the website thingswedontknow.com. Here you can find an easily accessible and extensive list of all the scientific mysteries and currently unanswered questions that are being worked on, with links to places that are studying them and references to relevant sites and publications. Things We Don't Know really says it best themselves. There are two distinct aspects of science, learning about what science has discovered and discovering new things. We feel that scientists tend to concentrate on explaining things that we already know and rarely explain the things we don't. We are dedicated to explaining the questions to which science still seeks answers. I highly recommend that you go and have a look at their website if you haven't already. I'm sure you'll find something there that will interest you, since learning about the things we don't know and the research being done to discover the answers to them is one of the most exciting parts of science. Thank you for watching this video, I really hope you enjoyed it and learned something new. If you'd like to learn more about our world, its history, and the wonderful life that surrounds us all, please feel free to subscribe to the channel if you think we deserve it, and if you'd like to see more from us.